as you pointed out very succinctly, the ability to inflict violence is what makes the world run. It sounds terrible to say that, but at the end of the day, that's true. You know, we, we always like to say, well, we're a nation of laws, you know, and that's like civility, right? But yeah. how are laws enforced? They're enforced by violence. You know, if yeah. you if you don't obey the law, you know, at first you might get a ticket. And then if you don't pay the ticket, you'll get a, a arrest warrant. And then if you don't come in and, and pay the ticket, you're gonna get arrested. And that means someone is gonna visit you with a gun. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. It is my pleasure to welcome Wesley R. Gray to the show. He is the author of Quantum Momentum, is his latest book, DIY Financial Advisor, Quantitative Value, Stock Picker, and another book off the subject, but about his military career entitled Embedded. And he is here to talk to us about his methodologies and what he thinks is coming around the corner for us. Wesley, welcome. It's great to have you coming from Puerto Rico, right? That's right. I live in- Where, uh, where Palma, a lot of you Palma. guys are coming from with your yeah, awesome yeah. tax deal. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I live in Palmas del Mar and, and there's certainly a lot of uh, crypto folks down I here. I have three friends that live in there. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. economy is changing pretty rapidly. Jerome Powell, I think, thinks he's the reincarnation of Paul Volcker, which I, I never thought he would have the guts to do what he's doing. But he seems to be pretty fast on the interest rate hike handle. He waited way too long. Everything ran way too hot for too long. He should have raised sooner and more gently, in my opinion. But what do yeah. you think? You know, I've been doing this for about 20 years, got a PhD from University of Chicago in finance. I don't know how I got into place, but a lot of people consider it uh, pretty good. Um, I used to be a stock picker. I used to be a prognos prognosticator. And honestly, I don't, I think a lot of things, uh, but I've learned that I don't really know anything. Um, so the, the primary way that we think about, you know, how do I allocate my risk? How, how do I allocate my assets? Um, how do I think about what Powell's doing? What have you? It, it doesn't really matter what I think. It's what prices tell me. And we are big converts and always have been uh, fans of trend following. And, and the basic idea is, is I just look to any asset market and if it has a positive trend, you know, and, and different markets are different, like we talk about crypto. But in general, if you just take something brain dead, like a 12 month moving average or a 12 month moving average, and, and if the price of that asset is above, great, I own it. If not, I go to cash or some people short it, right? And so if you look through that lens, as of literally two days ago, you really shouldn't own anything right now except maybe a sleeve of commodities. So ac according to, if you're a trend follower, which is kind of my, I guess, ethos religion, because I gave up trying to you know, predict what these people are going to do. I mean, it, it's certainly not a bullish stance. It's you know, it's been talking about or trend has been saying this for about you know almost uh, eight months now. I mean, really, the only kind of risk capital you'd be deploying right now might be in like a commodity sleeve of some sort. But otherwise, like equities, you should be flat market neutral. Uh, duration bonds, flat market neutral. Real estate market neutral. I mean, everything you should basically be sitting in cash being tactical, you know, waiting for different trends out there. And that's okay, also so let me, for, let me, before you move yeah. on, let me ask you about that. So sure. just to make sure we understand you're bullish on commodities, right? A little, the, I would say commodities are like not super bullish, but like, you know, better I, than everything else, better than there, everything else is in, is in the shitter in commodities. I would say not bullish. We were bullish, but now that trends are starting to break down there, it's less bullish, but okay. you know, depending on how you look at the trend, it's like some of them are still, you know, positive. So, so okay. I'm, I'm kind of bullish. So one of the things we talk about a lot on the show is a term I actually trademarked years ago called packaged commodities investing, where okay. when you buy the real estate, you're buying the copper wire, the concrete, the lumber, the petroleum yeah. products, all that, you know, the glass, the steel, et cetera. And so I like commodities too, but you know, on the cash component issue that you just mentioned, what about that evil doer, that pickpocket, that thief called inflation? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I yeah, know, 100%. So, so obviously, right now, if you sit in bills, you make like whatever, three and a half, four percent and and arguably like, well, obviously realize inflation is higher than that. So, so there's a cost to carry to being having a call option to move and maneuver. And it, that just is what it is, right? But, but that cost to carry, like whenever you have a bad trend, 
it's usually a signal of a, of a high likelihood of, of a left tail event, which means like a big loss of, of not talking like three or 4%, but maybe like 20, 30, 40%. So I 100% agree that, that right now cash as an asset probably isn't earning higher than like, expe- like what inflation is right now. But that said, you have that optionality to move and, and invest in assets that once they get a positive trend, you're, you're ready for it. Whereas, whereas if you just sit by and hold or static, you know, that, uh, that allocation now could be losing 30% before you can do that. So it's just a trade-off kind of, they, they have to think about, but I, I concur that uh, if one could find something that had equal risk profile of cash, but generate a lot higher return, obviously that'd be better, but that's hard to do because it's hard to find things that have cash like risk, but you know, much higher return uh, right now. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Moving on. What else do you think we should be uh, looking out for as we go down the road here? I mean, the other thing it's, and again, this is like boring, like Warren Buffett advice, but I see it all the time. You know, we have, I think $2 billion now in in advisement and and that's, you always got to watch and monitor the fees and taxes, right? Like in any world, but especially this world, the only thing you can really control in the end is like your tax rates. And, you know, they're probably not going down uh, <laughs> in the next 10, 20 years. And Uncle Sam charges a 50 percent performance fee to a lot of people. So I would always be on the lookout for ways to minimize, cut that down, because that's something you could control. And same thing on fees. Right. Like to the extent that you can find ways to access the asset class or, or whatever you're trying to do cheaper, more efficient. Uh, we always recommend that just because as market innovations are moving faster and faster, like. And we're all, we're also we're in the infrastructure business, so we see it every day. The opportunity to replicate or do what someone else is doing for half the cost keeps going up, which means that you should make sure you're always looking at alternative ways to achieve the same thing at half the cost. Because again, fees and taxes are things you can often control. Whereas we can't control what the economy is going to do, what inflation is going to do, but I, I can keep my fees down. I can keep my uh, tax rates down as much as possible. Yeah. Well, what is your outlook on the broader economy and inflation specifically? Are we going to see incredibly high interest rates needed to tame inflation, or do you think it's going to subside kind of the cost of money we're at now? So let me caveat this. I would attach zero credibility to what I think, (laughs) um, and I would just follow the models and be a trend follower. But if you ask my personal opinion on these matters, which again, I caveat you should you should put zero weight on them because they're just my personal opinions. And I already- The most humble, self-effacing guest we've Yeah, I, I honestly, I just, I just, I know too much about how this works and I've been humbled. I just don't believe what I say. But so for me personally, again, just at a hundred thousand foot view, it, it's, it's hard for me to believe that, you know, you can continue to operate as a banana republic and just you know, give people free stuff. People get lazier. They're less productive. They want more crap and they don't want to pay for it. Like, I just don't see how that ends well, you know, in, in like a 20, 30 year equilibrium, like in the short run, anything's hap can happen, but that would just seem to suggest to me that we should almost expect in the long run to have higher tax rates. Cause someone's got to actually pay for all this crap that we're giving everyone and, or inflation. I don't know the exact rate. I don't know exactly the transition of how we get there, but I don't, I just don't see how, you know, just from a math perspective, how it works out in our favor, um, just based on like, you know, the current status towards moving towards a banana Republic. But of course, you know, I'm a Chicago uh, PhD and, and that's called the Chicago school, like being rational and, and thinking about, you know, it actually matters to have sound money. But I, I also understand that there's another philosophy out there that is, I wouldn't say they've been right the last 10, 15 years, but you know, if you would ask me after 2008, I would have told you, oh my God, after what just happened, you know, there's got to be some inflation at some point from all this, and it hasn't really happened yet. But I guess this argument and this debate could be settled here in the next five to 10 years, finally. It's just yeah. taking a while. Yeah. So that's my personal opinion. But again, I don't, I don't really know. I just trend fall. Sure, sure. What else do you want to share with people about? Tell us about some of your methods and your data analysis and the way you follow and forecast trends. Sure. So, uh, I mean, our basic investment philosophies are very simple. When it comes to buying assets, specifically like equities, we focus on two dimensions, buying cheap stuff, better known as like value, 
and then buying momentum, i.e. buying winners, right? So, so that's exclusively what we focus on. Just And, and I kind of break that down to like the fear and greed impulse of the market, right? Value is kind of the fear. Like, why would you want to buy this total dirt bag, like super ugly, nasty thing that's really cheap that no one wants to own? Well, I want to own it because it's really cheap and no one else wants to own it. And eventually expectations revert, right? So we're all about cheapness. And then the other thing is like the shiny rock phenomenon, like humans also have a greed impulse. And I, and I think that's viewed through like the momentum lens where momentum is just a term in stocks is just like relative strength. It just means things that are moving faster than other stuff. We, we like those two characteristics. So if I'm stock picking, I'm buying cheap stuff and I'm buying things that have been winning, right? If I'm market timing, like trying to identify, okay, if I want to own stocks, I'm going to own things that are cheap and I'm going to own things that are winning. But what if I just don't want to own stocks, right? Like <laughs> what if all stocks are going to go down 50% and maybe value goes down only 40, like who cares? They're all going down a bunch. That That's where we leverage uh, like a trend following ethos. And, and again, that basic concept is you only own a risk asset if it's in a positive trend, because all the big left tail events occur in asset classes when they're in a bad long-term negative trend, right? And that goes for crypto, that goes for stocks, that goes for bonds, that goes for anything you can ever imagine that, that moves a lot. I just trend follow it uh, and that's it. So we buy cheap, we buy strong if I have to own it. And, and if, but then I also got to determine, do I want to own it in the first place? And that's where we use trend. And again, we just, just to keep it real simple, cause it's something that, you know, we got a thousand blogs on and there's books written about it. Um, if, if your users are just DIY, all you need is like, a, like a 200 day moving average, right? Like that's what a lot of people use. We don't use that in particular, but if somebody were to say, hey, why don't you use that? I'd be like, yeah, that also works. So anything that's like longer term dated for most asset classes is fine. The one exception I would say would be like crypto or assets that have like extreme volatility. Usually if you have an extreme volatile asset, that's like two to three times what a stock does like crypto, you usually want to tighten down that trend fall. So instead of maybe say like a 10, 12 month type deal or 200, 250 day, maybe use like a three to six month trend following rule. So if I'm trading crypto, I'm definitely not buy and hold. I, you know, if it's trending on three to six month moving average, I'm an owner. If it's not, I'm out. So like right now I'm obviously out because um, crypto's in the shitter. Um, but eventually, you know, I presume it'll start coming back, but I would wait till it had like a good three to six month trend. And then you'd want to enter that trade again. Why do you think Wesley crypto is doing so poorly when it should at least in theory, be yeah. the inflation hedge asset. Like, you know, I, yeah. I mean, where's Michael Saylor? You know, Bitcoin is digital gold, yeah. uh, but it's not <laughs> yeah. this time so, around at least. Yeah. So, so I've never, I'm a card carrying libertarian. I live in Puerto Rico. I'm right like there all that, you. Yeah. All that good stuff. I have never understood crypto personally. It, I just, I just call me old or something. I, I just old school. I just like free cash for I like profits, I like things like that. I understand the mission of what it's trying to achieve. And I understand that if it were to achieve the mission of becoming like a no kidding currency that was highly adopted by society, it's going to be worth a lot. My issue with it and where I've always seen the risk is how does that realistically ever happen in transition, knowing full well, you know, as being a former, you know, person that was in the side of violence, like the reason governments work and control as they control the violence. So unless crypto people have an army that can fight the US government and control violence and tax, they don't have anything. And yep. so in the end, they're never going to win this, this idea, unfortunately. And, and again, God bless them, right? Like <laughs> crypto makes so much sense to me. Like if you created this libertarian paradise, I'm all in, but I'm also just practical and maybe just too old and, and busted in, in the world. I just don't think it's ever going to happen. So I have never been a buyer of crypto as being this this like kumbaya like it's going to save like be sound money world personally and so I, I just think it's always been a speculative asset that is is really kind of a ponzi scheme for all intents and purposes it, you know but ponzi schemes can be valuable if everyone agrees it's a good ponzi because that would be like the us dollar that's also basically a ponzi scheme but at least we all agree to use it and it's a unit of exchange that, that is backed by violence and everyone agrees we're just going to use it. So it's a good Ponzi scheme. 
where, where crypto to me is like a Ponzi scheme that I don't see how you're going to get everyone else to agree to play in that game eventually, right? Is, I don't, well, yeah, it, you know, I, I, I think we are soul brothers on this one because I've been saying that from the beginning when I first learned about Bitcoin and it was $74, I have always said, consistent viewpoint, I would love to be wrong about this. I hope it takes over the world. I want to yeah. be wrong, but I yeah. don't think it will because the two most powerful entities the human race has ever known are governments and central banks. And yes. as soon as Bitcoin <laughs> has a standing army, then I will have faith in it. Uh, yes. But until then, I, I don't because as you pointed out very succinctly, the ability to inflict violence is what makes the world run. It sounds terrible to say that, but at the end of the day, that's true. You know, we, we always like to say, well, we're a nation of laws, you know, and that's like civility, right? But how yeah. are laws enforced? They're enforced by violence. You know, if, yeah. you, if you don't obey the law, you know, at first you might get a ticket. And then if you don't pay the ticket, you'll get a, a arrest warrant. And then if you don't come in and, and pay the ticket, you're gonna get arrested. And that means someone is gonna visit you with a gun. Okay. Yeah, and, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's the that's how every law works. It works at the end yeah. of the day with a gun. Okay. Yes, I agree. Yeah, and there, I, you know, I used to live with the Iraqis. Um, it, it was kind of very eye opening because they because they always say, "Oh, you want us to be free like you are." They're, they're like, you, "You did not unleash freedom in Iraq. You unleashed anarchism." Because if you're truly free. That also means that you could pick up a gun and shoot your neighbor. You could do anything you want. That's called anarchy. Like we are actually highly organized and not free at all in, in the U.S. where, you know, because they control the violence. And if like to use your point, like if I go shoot my neighbor, they're going to come over here, put me in handcuffs and put me in jail. And like you know, if it's really bad, they're going to kill me. Like in, in the end, you've got to have a lot of command and control in a society. You've got to have laws. And in the end, the, the main backstop to that is you know people don't like dying or getting shot it's just unfortunate but true yeah. and, and that's that's just how the world works unfortunately i wish it was not like that but and i don't want it to be like that but, but also but that but that's the way know. it is is a famous it's the way it is yeah, say, yeah. exactly yeah, absolutely um, well, wesley i so, know you've got to run because you've got a, a meeting yeah. with a bunch of very expensive attorneys and i know how those go unfortunately um I do. give out your website tell people where they can find out more of, of your work and your writings sure uh it's just alfarchitect.com and then we have a big uh presence on twitter uh just you know twitter.com at alpha architect um those are the two primary ways that uh you can access and we have a, a blog we have three to four blogs a week it's all free our mission is empowered through education so feel free to follow along and uh try, try to figure this stuff out uh like like you guys are it's it's a, a never-ending game of chess it, it sure is, but it is very interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's always fun. That's why I keep doing it. It's, it uh, it's a fun it's... game. Well, Wesley, thanks for joining us. Yep. Appreciate it.